Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you um, to the virtual SIP computational biology seminar series. Um, as you know, the idea is to um, bring to get, co together a computational biologists and uh, to um, broadcast um, those seminars uh, in order to share knowledge and expertise from the different groups at SIP as well as invited speakers. So this, this talk will be broadcast as, as you know. And um, today, we have the pleasure to have uh, Mark Iberson. So I'm going to tell a few words about him. He studied genetics at uh, Nottingham University in the UK. And he obtained a PhD in genetics uh, from the Imperial College London in 95. Then he moved to Lausanne for a postdoc in um, Bernard Torrance lab where he worked uh, already on the field of diabetes. Then in 2000, he joined a biotech company, Serono, called uh, now Marc Serono, uh, as bioinformatician. And uh, he worked on drug discovery uh, projects and uh, developing methodologies for sequence analysis and research knowledge management. And in 2010, he joined uh, the SIP in the Vital IT group, where he works now. Uh, and he's involved in large-scale genomic data analysis and system biology for Emedia. Emedia is a, uh, an innovative medicine initiative, IMI project on type 2 diabetes, and he also works on other projects uh, related to metabolic and cardiovascular disease. So, Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I didn't get much choice, but... <laughs> um, so, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, three things, systems biology, uh, networks and diabetes, and really, I picked this broad title because when I was asked for the title of the seminar, I really had no idea how to, how I was going to present what I, what I wanted to present. But I had three things in my head: systems biology, networks, and diabetes. But of course, all of these three areas are huge, and so in this talk, I'm only going to be really be talking about a very very small part at the intersection between these three um, areas. So what will I talk about in more detail? Um, I will first talk about um, a little bit about systems biology, for example, what it is and what it means to us in vital IT. Um, I'll talk a bit about networks and uh, some network concepts and also how we can use biological networks. And finally, for the main part of the, the talk, I will talk about um, how we are using network-based analysis um, in a systems biology project on diabetes. So, um, when I was looking for slides to introduce systems biology, I, I found this one from the Institute for Systems Biology, which I really like because um, it's called the Research Trinity, and we have three different areas. We have biology at the top, and technology, of course, and computation. And really, hopefully, we will start from a biological question when we do systems biology, and this will be um, where we use new technologies to try and answer these biological questions. And then, of course, this, these new technologies require, because they produce a lot of data, they require a lot of comp computation. And then, hopefully, when we do all the computations and analysis, we will come up with new hypotheses after some uh, time um, and thought. Um, and this will then feed back into the biology. And each cycle of this process will actually generate new technologies um, and new software from computation, new hypotheses, and new insights from biology. So some uh, of the systems biology projects we are now running or involved with at Vital IT are the following. I haven't written them all down here, but we have Emedia, uh, which is a project on diabetes, which I, I will focus on in my talk. We have um, Age Brain Cis Bio, which is a project on, on Alzheimer's disease. We have CISVASC, a project um, on vascular disease. We have a couple of Systems X projects uh, still running. Uh, for the Swiss in Initiative in Systems Biology. These are Host Path X and Lipid X. And we also have a project such as Infuse, which is a, um, a drug repositioning project in cardiovascular research, and also Synergia um, BXT, which is a, a project looking at the systems genetics of metabolism. So what happens often um, at the start of some of these projects is that the project manager or the project coordinator um, is not a bioinformatician or is not a analysis, an, an, an analyst. And as this caption says, um, 
he's saying in front of all the other people in his team, let's try to solve this problem by using the big data none, none of us have the slightest idea what to do with. I wouldn't say it's that bad when we look at our biological projects, but sometimes when I'm in the first meeting of a project, I get this impression that the people running the project don't really understand uh, what's involved in analyzing the data, and they, they really don't have that many questions. So it's really up to us to, to look at this data to try and analyze it as best we can to give them and feed this back to them in a way that they can actually interpret and, and drive the project forward. I'm now going to talk a little bit more about networks, um, give you some concepts on networks, very simple concepts, and also talk about how we can use biological networks. I want to come back just before getting into the networks to this idea of visualization. And in fact, visualization is not a, a recent thing. This is a, 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 an example of the power of visualiza visualization from 1854 London. And in 1854 in London, there was a cholera epidemic. And uh, one of the um, physicians at the time who lived in London, he was treating a lot of patients and he took the initiative to draw a map of London, um, or at least all the areas which were affected by cholera. And he put little points um, where all of the affected cases were um, that he was seeing on this and, and other doctors uh, were seeing on this map. And this is not the full map, it's just a, a part of the map. And what he found was that in fact, all of the cholera cases were radiating out of one area, which was uh, this uh, water pump on Broad Street. And this really shows you that even at that time, you know, just the fact of taking a step back and looking at a big picture can really help you, help you to see where the causes of something are. And of course, he uh, contacted the local authorities and they put a cap on the pump and they stopped the cholera outbreak. Um, and they stopped people using the pump. And in fact, if you go to London today, uh, there is, in fact, a monument to uh, John Snow, who was, the, um, who was the physician at the time. And there is a pub across the road from this, uh, which is called John Snow after, after him. So that's a little anecdotal uh, story. But it, it really shows you that visualization, or I think it, it's a story that, to me, means a lot. Because when we're talking about visualiz visualization, we want to really take a step back and look at the big picture. So uh, networks are useful for visualizing complex data sets. Um, networks are everywhere now. And this is a, an example that I, I quite like. Um, I like music, and this is a connections between artists and the last FM music database. And each of the nodes on this, on this uh, network are different artists. The different colors represent uh, what type of music they do. Um, for example, red is rock, uh, green is pop, and hip hop is blue. And I think just you'll, everyone will be able to see that just by looking at the way that the, the nodes or the artists are clustered together by the connections and, and who they're interacting with, you can see that, for example, rock artists and pop artists are more closely to, close together than, for example, rock and hip hop artists. So this type of network visualization can give you a global overview of what might be um, occurring and, and give you insights into how similar different groups of, of nodes are. So why do we want to use networks in biology? Well, analysis, uh, uh, first of all, analysis of individual data sets does not uh, maximize its value. And often uh, we find that if we're doing a big uh, analysis, the number of samples is often limited for statistical analyses. Um, often we use arbitrary cutoffs, for example, the uh, P less than or equal to 0 0.05. Uh, this is something which particularly I don't really like uh, because if you're trying to compare and contrast results, if you change the cutoff, then you change the comparisons and the results of the contrasts. Um, on alternative, it's not really an alternative. It's uh, something that I think we should do in parallel to this um, is uh, doing data integration in network type of analyses. So this is a data-driven approach. Um, this means that the network is generated from the data. Um, statistical cutoffs are not needed prior to integration. Um, a third point is that the data are integrated at the beginning and the resulting network contains all info needed for subsequent analysis. But it's an important point that we can always go back to the individual data set. So I'm not saying that we should only do network analysis. I think that network analysis can give us clues as to what's going on globally. And then we can go back to the individual data sets to really find out what's going on um, in more detail. So if you take uh, a set of random dots and you join them up randomly, uh, then you'll get something like this, which is shown on the, on the left, the random network. This is not the type of 
thing that you would see um, in a natural, naturally occurring network, such as a biological network or a social network. What you see in a social network, for example, is a, is a situation more on the right-hand side where you have certain nodes which are more connected uh, than the others. And uh, this type of network is called a scale-free network. Um, if, you make a net, if you make networks from uh, World Wide Web internet links or social networks or biological networks, you will get a network like this. There are, there are two um, important features of scale-free networks. The first is that the nodes tend to group together to form clusters or modules. Um, so some network layout algorithms such as Cytoscape will display this type of, um, this type of module clusters um, quite nicely sometimes. Um, and in biological networks, such modules may represent groups of functionally related uh, genes, for example, or, or proteins. A second point about these scale-free networks is that a, a small proportion of nodes are highly connected, and these can be referred to as hub nodes, um, and such nodes we think it, uh, are more important because they influence um, more the network and they're more important in the, net, in, in the network structure. So as an example of uh, um, what a module could be, this is a protein interaction network where each of the, um, the nodes on the graph here um, is a protein and the links between the proteins are physical interactions. And you can see that there are particular areas where in this particular layout the, there are many nodes clustered together and this could represent, for example, a module and we could infer from this that maybe the module in this type of network could represent a complex of several proteins interacting together. When I think of hub nodes, it's, I think I quite like the example of, of taking, for example, the uh, different airports. For example, this is in North America. Um, so obviously, the networks, or oh, sorry, the, 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 the airports with most incoming and outgoing flights are likely to be the, the, the airports which are going to be the most important if something goes wrong. Uh, so there, I like to think of the anal analogy of hub genes or hub proteins as, as like hub airports. So now coming into the, the, the major part of the talk, which is going to be on, on diabetes and um, how we're using net ba network based analysis for a systems biology project. So I'm first going to go into an introduction into diabetes, and then I'm going to go through um, two types of analysis that we've, or two examples of analysis which we've been doing for this particular project. First of all, for the introduction, type 2 diabetes is a, is a global health problem. In 2013, uh, 382 million people were diagnosed with or had diabetes. A lot of these are, are only predicted because they're undiagnosed. Um, Five million deaths were reported uh, from diabetes, and this had a global cost of about 440, uh, $448 billion. So this is a huge global health problem. What happens um, in diabetes is that the normal process of glucose homeostasis goes wrong. So what happens in normal glucose homeostasis is that when you eat food, um, this goes into the intest in, through the stomach and the intestine, and you get um, molecules or hormones such as GLP-1 um, that are secreted from, from intestinal cells, and these will act on the pancreas and cause, together with glucose, uh, the beta cells in the pancreas to produce more insulin, which will then uh, reduce the blood glucose um, overall. There are two effects. The effect of insulin is basically that it, it causes um, insulin-sensitive tissues, such as muscles, to uh, take up glucose from, from the blood. What happens in type 2 diabetes um, is that uh, the beta cells of the pancreas become damaged by metabolic stress, and this means that they cannot um, produce as much insulin, and this, can le this leads also to high bl blood glucose. Uh, a second effect is that the tissues which are responding to insulin are less responsive, and this combined effect also has a disastrous consequences in that it keeps this cycle of, of, uh, of um, chronic high glucose going. Type 1 diabetes, on the other hand, is when uh, the beta cells are in the pancreas are destroyed, so um, they are either less insulin or no insulin at all produced, and this obviously uh, leads to high blood glucose. So type 2 diabetes is the most common form of diabetes. It's 90 to 95 percent of cases. The type 1 diabetes is rarer and results from an autoimmune reaction um, that destroys pancreatic beta cells. Um, in both cases, whether it's type 1 or type 2 uh, 
um, uncontrolled diabetes can lead to cardiovascular disease, kidney failure, blindness, and nerve damage, among other, other things. So it's a very serious disease. Um, and especially recently, we've seen many increases, a lot of increase in type 2 diabetes due to um, people being more overweight um, um, and obese, um, unhealthy diet, and physical inactivity. So these are really lifestyle um, consequences or reasons for um, the increase in diabetes. And this can be seen in this, uh, well, this is a schematic showing what can happen if we have too much fat. So on the left-hand side, we have, if we have too much um, adipose tissue or fat, then this will increase uh, fatty acids in the blood. Uh, these will then be metabolized in the liver, and the liver will produce or release glucose and triglycerides into the circulation, which will have detrimental effects and produce a major metabolic load on uh, muscles, uh, which are insulin-sensitive tissues, which are taking up the glucose and the fat from the blood, and also will have detrimental effect to the pancreatic beta cells, and, we will, and there will be beta cell damage which will occur. And this causes a cycle where the, the tissues that are normally responsive to insulin will insulin will, will become resistant, and the pancreatic beta cell will become damaged, and this will reduce the insulin secretion as well. And really, we don't really know very much about what the mechanisms are um, for the beta cell damage. And so this is a focus of many studies now, um, and the focus of the study that I'm going to talk about now. So uh, finally, um, the current treatments for diabetes are symptomatic. So for example, we can add uh, we can give patients who have um, moderately damaged beta cells um, increased GLP-1, which is, uh, uh, inc will increase the secretion of um, insulin from the pancreatic beta cells. Um, for more um, drastic cases of type 2 diabetes, di diabetes where we really have um, much more advanced chronic diabetes, we have to give insulin, and this will obviously lower the blood glucose level. But we're really not... We're only treating the disease. We're not curing the disease at all. So the holy grail for type 2 diabetes is obviously a, a cure, to go from a symptomatic treatment um, to more of a cure. And, and the ways that, that obviously we, we can do this are to try to prevent the disease, either by lifestyle changes and so on and so forth, but also by pri trying to um, help the beta cell um, of the pancreas to be able to cope with new metabolic de demands or even to regenerate uh, new beta cell function, the pancreas, with new medicines. Excuse me. So um, now I'm going to talk about uh, this project, Emedia, which is a public-private partnership for type 2 diabetes research. Um, this project is European-wide. It's um, made up of a consortium of 14 academic institutions, eight pharmaceutical companies, one biotech, um, and the budget is um, 26 million over five years. We're now into the fifth year of the project. And uh, really, the, the, the focus of the project is on understanding the pancreatic beta cell dysfunction um, in type 2 diabetes and to try and identify the pathways which are underlying um, this dysfunction in type 2 diabetes and also to try to find biomarkers which will enable us to detect as a proxy beta cell functional uh, or b the beta cell function in, in patients that haven't yet become diabetic. So um, Immedia generates data from both mouse and human samples. We are at the center of the project. These are, this is just showing the different work packages in the project and we are at the center of this and we are involved in um, the integration or the, the data capture, first of all, and the integration and analysis of, of the different data coming out. And I really just want to focus on the top right-hand corner where we have in vivo models uh, for diabetes, which are in the mouse, and the bottom left-hand corner where we have a human repository um, pancreatic tissue. So we are really dealing with data mainly from these two uh, work packages. And I'm going to go further into the mouse study a little bit later. So one of the first things we did in the project was we developed a, a, a database um, and a web portal to enable the different partners from all over Europe to uh, put their data in the database and, and put in annotations, um, for example, clinical annotations, functional annotations, and so on and so forth. So we collected a huge amount of data, and um, I'm going to concentrate on um, the data 
from, that we collected from the mice, which is basically phenotype data um, during diabetes, um, some imaging data, and lipidomics and RNA-seq data. Now I need to um, tell you a little bit more about the mouse project. So the idea from this project is that if you feed a mouse a high-fat diet for three to four weeks, it will become diabetic, or in the most cases it will become diabetic and it will gain weight. The thing is that not all mice respond in the same way. So if you take uh, different mice strains, they will respond differently to the high-fat diet. So if you f take, so for example, three mouse strains here, you feed them the same high-fat diet, some of them will remain a normal weight, um, but they will get diabetes. Some of them will have a weight gain and they will get diabetes, but then others will remain completely normal. So the idea of the project was really to find out what, is, what are the differences, what are the molecular differences between these different mouse strains which will determine or predict whether these mice will become diabetic or not. So the experiment was that six mouse strains were fed a high-fat diet or a regular chow diet, and then we studied the evolution of diabetes over time in these six different mouse strains. And at each, for each of these different mouse strains, we measured uh, different measurements were taken at different time points. So we had measurements such as um, physiological measurements such as weight, um, how tolerant the animals were to glucose. So if we give glucose, how does this um, stay, does this keep high in the bloodstream or does it actually reduce? This is a measure of how diabetic the animal is. Um, insulin tolerance, which is um, measuring how insulin resistant uh, the mouse is. So we give insulin to the mice and we see how, how much the, the blood glucose actually drops over time. We also have um, islet morphology data where um, sections of pancreas from, from these mice have been taken and uh, we have quantification data on the number and size of, of beta cells and alpha cells, in fact, in the pancreas. And finally, we have RNA-seq um, and lipidomics data for the pancreas and also for um, lipidomics data for the, the um, plasma. So there are a total of 48 experimental conditions. So there are a lot of comparisons we could possibly make. Um, and really the first thing we wanted to do was really compare what we have, what we see physiologically with what we see molecularly. So here I've shown on this slide that um, I've divided the two types of data that we're collecting into those that can give some sort of physiological phenotype. This is the things like the weight, uh, the morphology of the islet, the glucose tolerance or insulin tolerance, and those which are more of a molecular phenotype, which are, of course, the RNA-seq and the lipidomics. And really we want to, as a first step, we wanted to see whether we could in fact um, see any correlations between the molecular phenotype and a very globally with the, with the physiological phenotype. So this brings me on to the first analysis example I'm going to give, which is a sample-centric view um, of, the, of this data. And this was using a, uh, an, a procedure called network fusion. A network fusion basically can be used to combine high throughput data sets. So, for example, if we have our two data sets from RNA-seq, for example, and, um, and uh, lipidomics, with the samples along the, um, along as, as uh, rows and the measurements as columns, we can transform this data um, into uh, similarity matrices, so comparing samples with samples. And uh, these can then be viewed in the same way as a network where each sample is a node and each of the um, edges between the different nodes is in fact a similarity score. And what's quite cool about this, this method is that you can, in an iterative process, you can learn, it learns a, a new network based on the, the two uh, networks derived from the initial data sets. And you get at the end a, a fused network which combines the original two networks from the two different data sets. And, we, and this is a nice way that you can combine molecular data, which is completely different, um, and try to find global um, patterns in this data. So we performed this analysis for the lipidomics and RNA-seq analysis from these mice. And uh, this slide shows um, on the left-hand side the, 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 the similarity matrix for RNA-seq. And you can see there are about six different squares of similarity on this on this um, 
on the similarity matrix, and these actually correspond to the different mouse strains. If you look at the lipidomics data, we, we get a, a more complex pattern. But I think the, the thing which is interesting, if we fuse these two uh, matrices or networks together, we get a, a, a fused um, similarity matrix, which actually, where you can see two groups coming up. And you can see this a little bit with the plasma lipidomics, but it's not very clear. But when you fuse the networks together, you can see this more clearly on, on, the, on the combined network. And if we take this um, fused um, network and we, well, we basically um, look at this in terms of a network, we can see that, in fact, there are two um, subclusters in this network. And here I've colored the, 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 the nodes by mouse strain or which strains of mouse they come from. And you can see that there are three strains which are represented on the left-hand side and three, well, four strains which are represented on the, on the right-hand side. There's only two of these yellow nodes uh, which represent mouse strains from, from the left-hand side, which are also in, in the right-hand side. And what is interesting is, in fact, these mice uh, that are in the, right, the left-hand cluster are actually more susceptible to high-fat-induced diabetes. So this already shows us that by combining the data together, we can actually find global correlations um, to phenotypic information. So the take-home message is that combining or aggregating molecular data can show patterns that are not clear when looking at separate data sets. I'm now going to just go through a, um, a more gene-centric view, which is what is a more a standard way of doing uh, this type of analysis. And uh, as I said before, we have many different uh, mouse conditions. We have 48 different conditions. But really what we want to find are signatures in the data. And here is an example from, from lipid, uh, from lipidomics uh, work. And here the, the, all of the, the rows are the lipids and the different mice strains are, the, are, are, are as columns. And uh, the, the yellow represents lipid concentrations which are relatively high compared to the, uh, to, to the blue squares. So what is clear from this diagram is that that we can see patterns emerging where there are groups of lipids which seem to have similar profiles across all the different mice. And what we'd really like to do would be to extract these clusters. And obviously, as many of you know, a lot of clustering methods exist. And uh, we chose to use one method for this, which is uh, weighted correlation network analysis, or WGCNA. So here, if we have, for example, gene expression data uh, with expression level on the y-axis and, and samples on the x-axis, we can actually find several groups of genes potentially in our data set where they have a similar profile across the samples. And we need a method that we will be able to extract uh, genes which have a similar profile. And, and from this uh, group of genes, we can actually create a, a network module. This is a network module. This is a, 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 a subnetwork which is generated from the correlation data. Um, and I'll go into in the next slide a little bit more detail on that. But the important thing here is that within this subnetwork or module, there are um, central genes which may be influential genes that are more connected within this network. So in a little bit more detail, uh, weighted correlation network analysis starts by creating a weighted correlation net matrix from the original data, be it RNA-seq or be it lipidomics or something else. Um, you then convert the method then converts um, this matrix to distances, and the distance is, which is used um, is called the topological overlap, which is actually a measure of how similar two nodes are, or two genes are, based on the number of shared neighbors that they have. And this is actually a continuous measure, which is just the degree of, how, uh, the degree of shared neighborhood that they have between each other. And from this uh, topological, topological overlap distance matrix, we can then do some hierarchical clustering and identify modules. The important and the interesting uh, point about this, this method is that you can actually um, correlate modules um, to particular clinical or functional traits. And this is interesting because normally, or sometimes when we're doing this type of analysis, we're trying to correlate genes, for example, to different, different uh, functional measures to try and find the, the genes which might be influencing the, the particular measure or the particular functional trait. Here, the idea is to correlate an, uh, an ensemble of different genes which have similar profiles to a particular trait. And for those of you who are interested, the, the, the metric which is used um, for this correlation is, well, it's, the, it's actually the module 
eigengene, which is the first principal component of the module, which is used as a vector and compared um, by normal correlation, such as Spearman, to uh, a vector of uh, clinical or functional trait values. So we detected uh, modules from WGCNA uh, from both RNA-seq and lipidomics analysis. And then we correlated these to the physiological traits in the mouse um, using Spearman's correlation. And we then selected modules for further investigation. So to cut a long story short, we identified a, a gene module uh, which was correlated to both insulin secretion and glucose tolerance. And here the, in this um, heat map, you can see on the, along the side, there are the, the module names. And along the, along the bottom, there are the different traits uh, which are a bit cryptic in this diagram, but but um, what I want to highlight here is that there is one module which is actually in the which is in highlighted in in red, um, which is correlated to both insulin secretion and and uh, glucose tolerance by the fact that those the 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 blue squares in the middle are very blue, which indicates that these are highly negatively correlated to this particular module. So we identified this module, and then we actually looked into this module to see what genes were there. And this is a representation of this module. Um, I can't show you the gene names, but um, in this module, the size of the node, or each node represents a gene, and the size of each of the nodes um, represents how, how connected it is, or how hub-like a particular gene is. Um, the different colors represent the, the, the degree of correlation to the particular trait, which is glucose tolerance in, in this case. Of course, as I mentioned before, we are not only studying mouse in, in, in the media, but we're also studying humans. And, and here, I just wanted to show that, in fact, we have lots of um, measures, such as lipidomics, gene expression, functional data, and also networks now, uh, which are, we have in common uh, between uh, the mouse and the human data. Of course, um, in, in mice, we have different mouse strains, and in human, we have we actually tissue banks. Um, of, of people who have either died um, and we've extracted, we've got some of their pancreatic tissue or, or they've had an operation. Um, again, in the mouse, we have uh, the high fat diet model of diabetes, and then in humans, we have the real thing. We have type 2 diabetes in normal individuals. And of course, we have the physiology, uh, physiology which can be measured very easily in the mouse, but can't really be measured very well in the human. So we're relying on clinical information, which is sometimes pretty sparse. But Generally, what we want to be able to do is to try to um, find the similarities and differences between human and mouse to try and understand, for example, which uh, mouse models might be good to, 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 to for a particular clinical trial for a particular drug. Um, and, to know, and to do that, we have to understand the mechanisms that are underlying the similarities and differences between mouse and human. And I'm going to show you on the next couple of slides one thing we try to do, which was really quite exploratory, to put the mouse and the human data together. And um, for this, we actually used uh, the idea of hive plots. And this is a hive plot showing um, combined mouse and human data. And in, a hive, in this particular hive plot, there are three axes. So the, the, uh, the, the vertical axis represents um, genes which are changing in uh, the human in type 2 diabetes versus normal individuals. Um, the axis pointing down to the left-hand side are genes in the mouse, so the mouse orthologs of these human genes, which are uh, correlated positively, sorry, correlated, correlated negatively to um, insulin secretion. On the right-hand um, um, axis pointing down, we have genes that are positively correlated, positively correlated to in vivo insulin secretion in the mouse. The links between the particular genes um, are links which we extracted from the network, from the, our WGCNA network. So these are evidence for co-expression. So this means that if there's a link, that means that they are having a similar expression profile or are similar in the overall network. And one thing we, which we can see from this, this image is that, in fact, if we look at all of the mice together, um, most of the genes which we find regulated in type 2 diabetes in the human um, are positively correlated to insulin secretion. Um, in the mouse experiment. Now, this may or may not be important or interesting for, for us, but um, I just wanted to show as an illustration because what you can do with this type of visualization is you can compare different um, networks together. And in the next slide, 
um, I show you um, networks which have been generated from all of the six different mice strains in all the different four time points on a high-fat diet. And here, only the, the genes are shown in the networks which are um, diff significantly differently regulated on a high-fat diet. If we look, for example, in the highlighted um, strain, which the strains are on the bottom and the, the time points are on the, on, along the side, um, we look at the highlighted um, mouse strain uh, DBA2J on the right-hand side, um, this, in fact, is a, a mouse strain which is, becomes very, very diabetic and obese. And we can see that many genes which are also, um, many genes seem to be activated at late time points um, in this particular mouse strain. And we look at another strain, Balb CJ. This is another strain which, which becomes a very di di diabetic. But here, the, the pattern seems very, very different. We see many genes being activated at early time points and less at the late time points. And another, if we compare this to another strain which is actually pretty uh, resistant to diabetes, uh, we can see that there are very few genes which are chaining. So really, I, I, this type of information is still giving you, trying to give you a global overview. We can't easily go back now into the, uh, and, and look in detail at these particular hive plots to see exactly which are the genes which, which are changing. But it gives you an idea where you should focus your effort for the next, for the next type of analysis. The next slide I want to show you as well is another global visualization of the mouse experimental data. And, um, and it's where we basically put all of the data together and we tried to map out and annotate it to see what um, types of things were hi being highlighted in the mouse experiment as changing on a high fat diet um, in these different mouse strains. And uh, we got a picture like this where we really, all of the, the underlying network is colored based on the different types of um, relationships between the different nodes, and I'm not going to go into the details of exactly what's in there, but there's all of the data which we could put in, we put in there. Um, and we annotated the, the, the network just basically by looking at what were the, the types of nodes which were in the particular areas of the network. And when we showed this to the, the biologists in the project, they got pretty excited because, in fact, this recapitulates many of the things which we would expect to, to be uh, going wrong um, in the in the in the pancreas of, of this uh, in, in diabetes so this can give you an idea as to which are the areas which are already just popping up from the data and uh, you can we can then put our efforts into them and, and this has been a quite a good starting point for us in the media uh, to at least uh, discuss with the the biologists and try to find areas which would be interest of interest for them to, to continue study so in summary um, systems biology, um, the research trinity of biology, technology, and computation is well upon us, so we really need to get used to dealing with increasingly large and, and complex data sets. Um, I think I tried to show you that visualization of complex data is, is important to identify patterns, and, and networks can help here, and not just the standard uh, ball and chain type of representation of a network, but also new network visualizations such as such as hive plots can be useful as well. Um, I've tried to show you as well that both sample-centric and gene-centric network methods can be useful for finding, for finding patterns in complex data. And uh, finally, we have applied such methods to mouse and human data from, from a large European project on type 2 diabetes. So finally, last couple of slides, where is this all leading us? Well, what we've realized over the last few years is that metabolic diseases seem to be getting closer together. And, and here I've just put some of the diseases where we are. We have some projects in vital IT, and these are all um, linked to what we could call metabolic syndrome. And I think this is the type of view which we're going to see more and more in the future, where instead of looking, for, looking at individual diseases, we're really going to be looking more at the overlap between the different diseases and uh, what is underlying the, the, uh, the, the, the fact that some diseases are linked together. And my last slide is really just a representation of, of a disease network. And this is from a, a publication, I think, from 2008. Um, so quite old now. But it really, th this is based on um, OMIM, or ondine, uh, uh, OMIM genes, which have been um, mapped from different diseases. So things like enzymes, which are uh, known to be mutated between in the same diseases will create a link between different diseases. And then they put on top of this network um, information on actually what is the 
co-occurrence of particular diseases. So they used clinical records for this. And what it shows you is this type of clustering where you see, for example, diabetes being clustered together with obesity and, 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 uh, and hypertension and myocardial infarction and stuff like this. So what we might see in the future, it would be good to start with a network like this and then to try to go down further and to try to drill down and see whether we can identify the common mechanisms and, and use this as a, a, a start point for finding uh, new drugs which can maybe tackle several diseases at once um, and prevent uh, comorbidities from occurring. So um, I presented my view of some of the data that we've analyzed, um, and this is really only a very small part of what has been done um, in the immediate project. And, and I just wanted to make the point that we are a very multidisciplinary team, and it's not just me. Um, so we have people um, <coughs> who are involved in data analysis, project management, algorithm development, um, we have uh, Robin, who has been essential for all of the web-based development and data visualization, which I didn't show today, but it's been a huge amount of work. We have a lot of people, such as Fred Leonor, um, who are working on the statistics and data and knowledge management. Also, uh, Dima is now working on restructuring all this data into RDF format so we can reuse it this uh, later on in other projects. And uh, we have, obviously, the IT infrastructure. So I put uh, Roberto, but it's the whole team behind here who is making sure that we can still work at Vital IT. And uh, finally, and last and not least, uh, the lipid and protein annotations. Because, in fact, when we're generating this data, we need to generate, in order to generate hypotheses to feed back to the biologists, we need annotations. And, and people like Anne and Alan and Lucilla have been very important in trying to bridge the gap between uh, what we're finding from the computational analysis and, and what we're actually um, presenting back to, the, to the, uh, uh, the biologists in this project. So I just have a couple of acknowledgement slides for um, the Media Work Package 2A and the Media package, Work Package 2B, which was the human study. So with that, um, thank you very much.